Hello, and welcome to episode 42 of the Extreme Hardware Podcast. We've got a fun episode today. Uh, we are yeah. joined... Thanks, Chris. We're joined by Jack. It's his birthday. <laughs> yes. Happy yeah, birthday, it's Jack. my birthday. I'm old. <laughs> and yeah. since Chris is so enthusiastic, we also have Chris, Axifer, myself, Simmons, and we actually have a special guest today. We have uh, our good friend, Wendell, from Level 1 Techs. <laughs> What's up? And not much. Um, so with with having Wendell on, um, both Jack and I have been watching your content for a while, and we figured that we, uh, if you wouldn't mind, we're going to do a little bit of a little bit of interview session at the very beginning, and then we'll go back to our normal format and just have some lovely times with that. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, that sounds good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I'm really glad that you uh, were able to show up. So, yeah, awesome. Um, uh, Jack, would you like to start, or do you want me to go ahead first? I would like your question first, so let's go with yours. Okay, so one of the things that I've known about your content for a while is you are a big advocate of like home lab, home server kind of stuff, and just trying to build something for you to test yourself. Um, when did you really start experimenting with like a lot of like home lab stuff? Uh, what was some of your motivation? And do you have any notable projects from the last 10 years uh, that you'd like to talk about? Um, I've probably been doing this stuff since I could pick up a screwdriver. Like, you know how in like fourth grade, they ask you what you want to be. My, seriously, no joke. My answer in fourth grade was I want to be a robotics engineer. And that was sort of <laughs> yeah. science was like a thing. And eventually that evolved into computer science. So I don't know. I, it's kind of weird. Like people are like, what do you want to be when you're growing up? I've always known it was, it was always a thing. So <laughs> I've done a lot of really just, you wouldn't believe unholy things. I got in trouble so many times for like taking apart the television and just really terrible things, but I always managed to get it back together. Except for that one time I accidentally broke the little tailpiece off the, uh, the CRT and it, oh, no. <laughs> the vacuum wasn't a vacuum anymore. I got it reassembled. It just didn't work. <laughs> VIRL. Well, so so I, I take it a lot of your uh, tinkering then was just like trying to rip something apart and just seeing if you could put it back together. Or did you have some objectives in mind when you went into uh, mass destruction mode? <laughs> Mostly it's just curiosity. So like satisfying that insatiable curiosity sort of gets me into trouble, like basically all the time. And I never really lost that. And that is a lot of fun. And most of like the home lab, home automation stuff and just anything like that is really on the one hand, it's like, can I make my life better or is this something that would actually be awesome? But most of the time it just turns into a, let me figure out how this works. Okay. I can kind of see the end here and then I don't need to finish the project anymore because I can, I can sort of see where it's going to go. But there are a few things that I have that I really like in the way of like, just little basic quality of life things for automation. Like you'd be surprised. I've got a, I've got a little mini PC, like one of those old I five, like all in one machines. Oh yeah. And, and it's got a bunch of USB sticks that I can plug into it. And depending on what the volume label is, it'll automatically set up everything for me. So like Ventoy is a, like an EFI stub loader thing that'll load ISOs. And I discovered mm -hmm. that like a year or two ago. And so that machine, when I plug it in, if I, if I label, if I take a blank USB and change the volume label to Ventoy and shove that in, it'll automatically deploy ISOs for all the current versions of Windows, Ubuntu, Fedora, Arch, and, and a bunch of other things, the USB. So if I just keep the USB in there that's labeled that, it handles updating it. Oh, neat. That's actually really impressive. I need one of these. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you think about it, and it's like, what is that really? And it's like, it's a bash script with a bunch of lines <laughs> and that's it and that's all it is and so it's like this it sounds really impressive but then you look at it and you, it's like no that's not it's not actually like it's not really but when it's it's really handy when it's like i need to reinstall windows on this machine or i'm setting this thing up for a benchmark and i need to do a thing or i've got to install fedora and whatever you can shove that in there and it's always going to be the latest version of fedora so you're not spending you know 17 hours downloading package updates mm -hmm. I, uh, yeah, um, actually, I'm going to flip it over to Jack now, um, and we'll go with one of your questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, my big thing is that, you know, I do a whole bunch. Well, I try to uh, do as many reviews uh, as I can, but I noticed that every single time that I review a piece of computer hardware, it's, it's my whole life until that review is done. 
and I just feel dead when I'm done with a review. How do you deal with all of that mental pressure when you're like doing like a big in-depth review? I, I don't, I don't really know that I do all that well. Um, I mean, I mean, it's just, you know, <laughs> you ever watch the <laughs> Simpsons and there's like an episode of the Simpsons where something bad happens to Homer and he's just in the corner rocking back and forth. <laughs> oh yeah. I relate <laughs> yeah. to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, just cause that's not on camera. Don't think that that's not <laughs> happening. <laughs> um, no, there's a, one, one thing does give me a little bit of comfort. So this one time I screwed up in kind of a big way, some test files mm. made it into production. And the end result of that wasn't super bad, but it could have been kind of super bad. And um, the test file that made it into production was to order a 55 gallon drum of barbecue sauce in a, in a food grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That was a test file that I was using for a very important, very large uh, order handling system. I accidentally ordered a 55 gallon drum of barbecue sauce. <laughs> but <laughs> until I knew what, you know, I could have accidentally ordered a thousand barrels of barbecue sauce. I didn't know. And so um, it was kind of panic attacking and like it was, it was really bad. And so since then, you know, it's like, oh man, I got this graph slightly wrong or I got the label wrong on whatever for this processor. I just think back to the, the barbecue sauce and it's like, no, this is fine. So how much does one of those run you? Uh, there, I think it was only like a thousand or eleven hundred dollars, something like that. It wasn't, it wasn't super bad. Okay. So about the same as a 55 gallon Trump off lubricant. <laughs> yeah, well, I actually managed to get the order canceled. But the amount of time involved in canceling it was probably more than a thousand dollars of time because like all of the layers <laughs> that you have to go through of bureaucracy to be like, no, that wasn't real. That wasn't, we didn't really need to, that wasn't a real contract that anybody signed for <laughs> a 55 gallon drum of barbecue sauce. Oops. You know, the <laughs> test data made it into production. Don't worry about that. And like having to explain that about 74 times. Like if I could have just paid $1,100, I would have rather do that. But that wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I distinctly remember uh, uh, my previous job. I was working at a data center and we were you know, handling, you know, remote uh, uh, data center connections for a, a lot of different sites. And I remember um, I was being through this uh, Cisco Nexus switch and just trying to learn it and playing around. And then I, uh, you know, that wonderful feature of putty where you right click and it paste everything into putty. And uh Oh no! I accidentally slipped and ended up blacking out half of the data center for a good 15 minutes as we panic run to the data center with a console cable just so we can uh, revert the change. And oh man, that was uh, a painful Oof. two weeks of my my career there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes stuff like that happens. I mean, it's it's fine. It's it's you know, it's like, can we change the process to prevent test files from going into production? And in this case, it wasn't actually a bad like. The ultimate result of it still wasn't completely terrible because some some good things came out of that in terms of like finding bugs <laughs> and the way that orders were handled. Mm -hmm. But you know, you, no no one ever no one ever remembers that. Of course not. No. Yeah. Um, we had a very very um, excitable uh, coworker at uh, the networking team, and uh, he was one of those individuals who he was he would narrow down on what he thought the problem was and just run that into the ground without actually doing some like external, like looking in It's like, maybe it could be this. Maybe no, no, it's gotta be this. I'm going to just keep running this down. Uh, you don't have the answer. Okay. You don't have the answer. And then it, eventually we ended up getting an email from the head of uh, the DHS uh, saying, please do not directly reach out to the GS 14 who works here <laughs> when you have questions. <laughs> oh man. Wait, I'm just thinking back to the barbecue sauce. At this point now, you have your own <laughs> web store. You just brand, get a bunch of small little vials, and just have just level one barbecue sauce with like the first <laughs> 500 orders on the store. Yeah. <laughs> no one, no one would ever under. I may, I may fully explain that story someday. Like I might turn that into a video because it is actually really interesting. But you know, you you find out a lot of things when you do stuff like that because. You know, there are certain people that you work with that are just so uptight and so insane, like they lose their mind mm -hmm. over stuff like that. And it's like, OK, one, that's actually probably not the biggest screw up in the system. Like there are a lot of people that are deliberately doing terrible things in this system, much worse than this. that cost a lot more money than this because they're de deliberately 
you know, breaking the system or doing whatever because it handles a lot of orders. But um, at the same time, you know, it's like you're freaking out and making everybody miserable when it's just like, all right, you know, let people do their job and fix it. And we have system in, systems in place for dealing with this. It's not like we accidentally deleted Cleveland. You know, this is fine. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's kind of amazing how many meetings end up being generated after a minor to major occurrence happens. It's like, yeah, we're trying to deal with this, but no, you have us in this conference room now. <laughs> Fun. Yeah, and, and, and you know, some 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 people are just really terrible to work with in those kind of a scenario, and in, in 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 general, and those kind of a scenarios will amplify it to the nth degree because it's like, hey, sometimes there's stuff like this. You know, the reason that this is, you know the the cost of this system overall is not 10 times more expensive because it's not hardened against these kinds of failures and does it make sense to spend 10 times as much on this system versus just deal with occasional errors like this and then it's like oh you know it turns into that kind of a conversation and it just doesn't you know i mean if you if you've got a million orders going through the system and one order fails that's a one in a million failure so did you build the system to you know, be that elaborate that it can survive a one in a million failure. No, you didn't spend that. Okay. Well then you should be thankful. 100%. Yeah, um, so let's go over to yours. Yeah. With uh networking nerd stuff. Yeah. 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 So obviously I've gotten really into network engineering. It's become my career field. And like I mentioned before with the whole home lab question, obviously the best way to get into your home lab is by scraping eBay, scraping Craigslist, uh, some uh, government auction sites and stuff along those lines to get, you know, some catalyst switch that was either uh, end of life about six years ago, but it's still a full gig switch. So you can pay 40 bucks for it and you can get things set up or um, my Dell C1100 one U server that I converted into a tower because I didn't want to deal with 1140 mil fans spinning right next to my head at all hours of the day. Why not? <laughs> Uh, gee, I wonder. <laughs> Jack already has uh, enough on his plate RTXing yeah, your background noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <shut> up. <laughs> it's not my fault, technically. But so, but I have started noticing, you know, back when I was first getting into a lot of this stuff and, you know, watching videos on, you know, this is the kind of hardware to scavenge for. This is the stuff you want to stray away from, that things have actually gotten a little bit more expensive um, in terms of at least like the networking gear. And then I've even noticed with a lot of like server parts where, you know, a couple of years ago they were 10 bucks for a new NIC or 20 bucks for a new SAS card. And now it's like tripled and quadrupled in price just for, you know, my specific use case. Um, have you uh, been experiencing anything similar to that? Maybe the flip side where you go to purchase some used piece of gear and uh, either the price is what, uh, what you expected or not what you expected. Oh yeah, it's a it's a trash fire. It's Amazon's <laughs> fault. Uh, not really, but sort of, kind of. Because oh god, yeah, Amazon Marketplace is just yeah, and uh, don't get me started. <laughs> and it's just so you've got Marketplace on the one side, and so like if you have a government surplus or a university surplus or something like that, you can go get stuff from there, and that's fine. And you you know you, maybe you can get a reasonable deal, but for everybody that's actually putting it online, um, you can get more than it's worth a lot of the time. I mean, it's worth whatever somebody's willing to pay, but there are a lot of people that are setting up their home lab and don't really know a good value because it's like, hey, check it out. I've got my X5600, my dual socket X56, you know, 5620, 5630, you know, socket 56 yeah. Xeons. And it's like, uh, guys, uh, you know, you, you're going to spend less. Like if you take into account everything that you paid for to get that machine and then 100 gigs of RAM and then your electricity cost, uh, just get a Ryzen 3900X. You're going to be better off, and it's going to be faster. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I think at this point, like, back when uh, I can recall Golf Town being, like, the hot thing to get, which uh, Dell server was it? Is it the uh, R610? I think that was a really popular one for a while. Yeah, it was. Uh, but just, like, 2P, uh, Golf Town, or Bloomfield. But, like, even then, they were, like, 50 bucks a chip. When I was looking at them, it's like, nowadays, this is more, like, almost has full price i think like you're looking at i mean yeah it's still it's still old xeons but you're looking at several generations older than you should for a much yeah. better cpu for roughly the same price factor in electricity and yeah you're 
that, that's a bad buy. Also, I don't think they support ADX, which could be a problem. Yeah, no, there's a there's a huge amount. I mean, it just doesn't. A lot of the older stuff doesn't make sense. I mean, you take into account the mitigations, and I mean, you can disable the mitigations, but I mean, it's just. <laughs> And then PCIe quirks, it's just hardware stuff, oh, and it's just yeah. it's on the precipice of just terrible. I mean, even like look at the look at the commercial lifetime of socket 2011. Good lord, they will not let that socket die. That socket has been obsolete for years, and they're still selling processors for it. Yep. And so that's messed with the market. Um, the last thing that the the, the one counter example I can think of is uh, uh, liquidated Arista switches, maybe, and maybe flash storage. So I picked up some Arista switches for like two hundred and eighty to three hundred and twenty dollars very early in the release cycle when data centers were being upgraded. Those are ten gig switches, ten gig copper switches. Well, they have SFP as well, but ten gig copper switches with forty gig uplinks. But it's the older ten gig standard, so it doesn't do the low latency correctly, and it doesn't do the uh, the RDMA or uh, RDMA stuff correctly. It can mm. with a firmware update, sort of, kind of, but. You know, for lots of high IOPS stuff, it's still not great. Um, and those are pretty good. But but now those switches are like $500 on eBay. Yeah. yeah. Networking gear has, I, especially when trying to look into going to a 10 gig uh, just home infrastructure, it has just been such a mess trying to find things that... <laughs> I mean, okay, so you're running a specific Linux distro and, and some XYZ Mellanox uh, NIC that is actually cheap is just not compatible unless you start doing some hard coding. And it, it, it's it, the, I don't know, the landscape is really skewed recently. Well, so some of it is not true compatibility issues. Some of it is vendor lock-in. So like with those Aristas, they have vendor lock-in for the media adapters. They have minute vendor lock-in for the 40 gig transceivers they have vendor okay. lock-in for like three or four other things fortunately it runs linux <laughs> so you can just go in there and be like turn this nonsense off and it's fine <laughs> oh uh but. speaking of vendor lock-in wendell um did you see the bit i guess about a month ago where i can't remember which company is doing this it's one of the big server companies but they're doing uh lock-ins for uh epic cpus well this so, is hp yeah so like you get a shiny new CPU, you pop it in the socket, and now you can never use it in another motherboard. And I didn't see anything beyond that. If there's like some way to uh, reverse that, or if that's just a permanent thing, and no, so well, if you want to use it otherwise, I believe I believe that the the correct implementation is that the CPU is fused for Dell or HP itself, and so if you have a non fused mm -hmm. CPU. It will work in any motherboard, but if you have a fused CPU, it will only work in the OEM specific motherboard. Oh, interesting! So it's like a special SKU for uh, those guys. Yeah, yeah, and okay. some of the, some of that is because so like I was working on HP HP DL three sixty Gen ten the other day. Not a terrible chassis, dual socket thirty six forty seven, dual power supplies, reasonable backplane. Doesn't come with the midboard fans, same as Dell, which is ridiculous. And nonsense, um, but they play it so razor close uh, to the tolerances in terms of like power delivery and everything else like that for the thirty six forty sevens that some of those higher end uh, Xeon SKUs like the two hundred forty watt ones won't even boot. So uh, even if you wanted to run like the uh, the off road map like the eighty one twenty four M, which are up to two hundred forty watts, but they'll work at two hundred ten watts. You literally can't do it in that chassis because it's like, oh, it's not HP Enterprise. HP also really shafts you other in, in other interesting ways. Like, it's a it's a SATA backplane by default. It's nothing special, and so it's like I'm going to get some 16 terabyte, you know, Seagate, you know, uh, Firecuda or, or Exos or whatever, and run those drives because they they don't have the HP Enterprise firmware. It's like, oh, these aren't HP Enterprise firmware drives. I'm not going to have the LEDs work correctly. Like that's kind of punitive, don't you think, HP Enterprise? <laughs> <laughs> and I think, um, actually, uh, with this next question, we're going to flip it over to Jack again. Um, well, I'm just going to quickly ask you an in, uh, a thing that happened in the last uh, podcast that we had. Uh, I was made fun of because I don't know how error bars work in Excel. Do you, do you know how error bars work and will you teach me one day? Yeah, we can do a screen share. That's fine. 
Awesome. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Chris is not going to be yelling at Jack anymore. <laughs> yeah. Just, just charge I, the hours to Enterprise. <laughs> I really, really don't want to teach Jack statistics. I, just, <laughs> I, I can't. <laughs> See, that's, that's one of those things where I want to just like not think about it. Like I want to automate that. Like we don't even need to be using mm-hmm. Excel for that. We need to be using like Python and we need to take the dumps directly from like Hardware Info 64 and possibly MSI Afterburner and have a PowerShell command that you run and it dumps it to a Python service that's listening somewhere and then it just generates everything and you don't even have to think about it. Ah, oh, nice. That's a dream. Yeah, yeah it is. It, that's the dream. Easier said than done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, next on to my real question here. Well, that question. Oh, I want to bring up something that I did uh, a while ago, which was, um, so on our previous community that we were in, uh, we had, you know, we do folding at home stuff, you know, everybody's doing folding at home stuff, but we had like little, uh, inter-team competitions, um, that you could sign up for and, you know, whoever folds the most within a month, uh, you know, stuff, you could be on leaderboards and all that. And I basically went wild. This was when um, uh, Ryzen first launched. I had an 1800X and I was trying to get the most performance out of it. And I noticed that, well, one, if you fold on every core of the CPU, it's slower. If you manually set the affinity using HTOP in Linux to basically, you know, just conform to the way the CCX works and everything, uh, you end up getting a uh, higher, you know, PPD points per day value. And I went even further and then I was just like, I'm going to compile my own kernel at this point. So I compiled my own kernel. I made it, uh, I think you, you could like set like it to be server responsiveness where it doesn't have any preemption and all of this other stuff in the kernel. And it was basically unusable as a desktop computer once you started folding. <laughs> you you move the mouse and the mouse would skip all over the screen. But as long as you could log into it over, you know, a shell, you could start up folding. And that thing was a powerhouse. Uh, I don't know if there's a question in there, but like, <laughs> what what do you think of like going through that amount of effort uh, just to get more points in folding? <laughs> no, uh, well... So no, that's actually really good practice. So um, not for the folding aspect of it, like no one mm-hmm. cares, but like that exercise <laughs> is totally... <laughs> Honestly, true. Agree. Yeah. Yeah. But, Simmons. But no, no, seriously, like doing that exercise, like if you go through that exercise, but instead of folding at home is the program that, that you make awesome. If you mm-hmm. figure out whatever some companies like program that they use to make money is, and you do that same optimization for that, you will make a lot of money because, uh, you know, take, like look at clear Linux, like clear Linux, mm-hmm. in, Intel went in and basically did all of that stuff to make everything really run and sail well. And it's yep. not that the stuff they took out didn't need to be there. It definitely does need to be there in some context, which is why, you know, all other Linux distros have adopted what clear Linux has done. Yep. But, um, by doing that, yeah, you can squeeze out a lot more performance because you're optimizing and attuning it for the one specific thing. Look at what Netflix does. I love Netflix's performance blog. I love talking to those guys. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's a little different because it's like more on the free BSD side, but they've like completely like they've, they've taken, you know, what you did with folding to the nth degree with free BSD and their network drivers and crazy stuff like that. And now it's just, you know, like one of those Netflix boxes is like, we got the cheapest processor we could which is, you know, basically out of a Cracker Jack box. And now we can saturate 10 gig Ethernet, no problem, out of this, you know, server that costs $1,500 or whatever. I'm exaggerating, but you read the performance blog and it's just like, wow, mm. this is insane. Cloudflare is another one. Cloudflare has done crazy stuff. They move some of the stuff from user space into kernel space, which is counterintuitive. But by <laughs> doing that, they dramatically increase the number of packets per second that the kernel can handle. Cool. So, so good to know that uh, your efforts were not in vain. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's just for something that nobody cares about, Simmons. Yeah. Well, okay. I don't know. Okay. I, I do, I do that. Job. So I, I do that so often with stuff, though, where I'll go off onto the deep end and just this. It's all I'm talking about for like weeks straight. And yeah, 
And then I'm yeah. like, at the end of it, like, why did I do all this? Hopefully this yeah, could be applied to something else. It's you a slightest dopamine hit. Yeah, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, well, I mean, you've got your one big project you're working on right now that uh, I think falls into that category. Yeah, that that's actually been lasting longer than in most projects that I've been doing was I'm on like two and a half months now. That's pretty good. I don't remember what you were doing. Was this uh, or... building a game? Because I just wanted oh, to yeah. see an old game that was in DOS have RTX in it. And I was like, this doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm going to make it. <laughs> that's amazing, actually. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's like something he would do. Yeah. <laughs> that is the TV disassembly level of, of curiosity, which is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, actually, I want to transition over to Axie. He had a quick question for you as well. Yeah, so I think I actually first found Level 1 text and really realized who you guys were with uh, the Looking Glass project when I was trying to get into more Linux gaming and realized there's a lot of Windows applications and games that just, just don't work. Um, how is that whole project coming along? I haven't seen much for updates on the main Looking Glass thread in the last year or so. Oh, we've got a lot of... I'm really a little overdue for doing an update on, on Looking Glass. Uh, Jeff has done an insane amount of work on it. And uh, one one interesting niche that's come up is uh, streaming with cursor capture. Um, I think OBS beta added some support for cursor capture, but depending on what the game is, it's a little problematic. But uh, you can use Looking Glass to, uh, to you know, do the, do the... I don't want to call it streaming, but do the... the, the, the uh, you know, the whole virtual machine, the Windows VM inside the Linux VM thing. And then OBS has a plugin uh, now that will read directly from the looking glass frame buffer. So it's a memory to memory copy. You're limited just by how long it takes the memory to co like copy the frame buffer from the video card to the memory, which often is faster than the display buffer actually on the card, which is sort of <laughs> nuts. Um, and uh, you can, you can kind of see the, uh, um, you can kind of see that in some of the high speed footage and stuff, but, uh, and then you capture that directly with OBS and it's a cleaner, better capture because it's the, um, it's, it's directly the memory frame buffer copy. So that's really awesome. The, the biggest downside has been that a lot of game, it's gotten so popular that a lot of game companies are like, Oh, something weird is going on. We think probably people are cheating. So they like, yeah, really do go out of their way. Whereas before they didn't really, you know, it was just you know, sort of fringe. And they left it alone. And maybe there are cheaters that are trying to use the whole virtualization thing to do it. But I don't, I mean, you know, if cheaters are going to go to that, they're going to get, you know, motherboards with like the in circuit debug headers. And they're going to start using like JTAG and stuff to actually mm -hmm. like do in undetectable in circuit debugging. I mean, if that's, if they're really worried about that. So I just, it seems like they're punishing honest customers. I actually just have no. one quick follow up yeah, for the looking fast. glass thing. Um, I know that before there was some issues with audio and stuff, Wendell. Um, I'm not sure what you're working on now, but I've also been using actually a V-band as part of a voice meters suite of virtual mixers to transfer audio between machines, between working at home and all that. And it's surprisingly amazing for just a free tool. But uh, what's been done for audio on uh, Looking Glass lately? Uh, most of the, like, so... Most of the audio stuff is actually not really looking glass specific. It's just virtual machine specific. There actually have been a lot of improvements in like KVM and timely interrupt handling and all of that kind of stuff because most of the audio issues just arise from the para virtualization aspect of it. And so like that's where most of the rough edges are. But I think mostly it's fixed. I mean, it can still be depending on what your distro is and your setup options and blah, 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 there still are some hoops to jump through, but it's a lot better situation than it used to be. And personally, I would usually use a pass through like a $5 USB DAC or the pass through audio device from the GPU. And that was never like in that scenario, it's never really an issue, but otherwise it does depend on your sound card and drivers and some buffers and some other things. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. And uh, Jack, it looks like you have it as uh, something. When um, my 10900 got bricked by my ASRock motherboard um, from um, things reading the Super I.O. chip is my theory. And because uh, I had hardware info 64 running, I think another thing running and 
Then I started a CPU load and then it just never worked after that. And I was wondering if you have any insights, because I think we were talking about that and you said you, you might have, and I want you to kind of elaborate on that. Yeah. So, uh, the system, like, uh, there's another way that RGB is like the bane of our existence and we don't even realize it. And that is, um, like interfacing to RGB devices is not something that was really ever intended. Like there's not really an extra communication bus there. Mm -hmm. So when you have like RGB RAM, for example, it's literally using the same bus that the EPROMs are on for, you know. Oh my God, why? Yeah. <sighs> so you can accidentally reprogram your your uh, your SPD on your on your uh, on your DDR4. Oh, <laughs> that's amazing. Well, because I well, well no I no I distinctly remember uh, a couple years ago. Uh, in our former communities podcast, we had an interview with JJ from Asus and he, he, we were talking about a lot of the RGB features that they were integrating into the motherboard. And of course I was complaining because her, der, my gamer RGB had not working the way I wanted to, blah, blah, blah. but, but he, but then he started explaining a lot of the issues and it's just like, Oh yeah, you know, we basically have to like drill holes in the operating system. So to allow it to talk with like the EPROMs and the BIOS of the motherboard just to make things happen. <laughs> God, I remember um, sometime within the last year, I tried to pull up the story, but I can't now. Uh, some InfoSec person on Twitter was uh, looking at, I think it was an Intel motherboard, but the RGB was controlled by like a GPIO pin on the PCH. Just mm -hmm. exposing this, it's just there. Here's a GPIO pin, solder things to it, go have fun. <laughs> what, why? <laughs> there, there's actually kind of a lot of things like that like one of the functions in the pch is to read main memory mm -hmm. yep like that's, that's just the thing <laughs> like does, yeah. does the pch need to read main memory i don't think it does but then it's like yeah no it can well i mean that's kind of important that's got a you know pretty much everything except the graphics card attached no. to it but now here's yeah. the here's the really mind blowing thing that you guys you guys might not be in the in the loop on this, but you know RDMA, right? Like uh on the you know, your network card is well it's related to I don't know how to really RDMA, what, that's uh built that's part of the uh, co uh the collision algorithm, correct? No, no, R RDMA is um basically your you know, you've got two computers on a network and the remote mm -hmm. computer is basically going to get direct access to some portion of memory on the destination host machine so that the network transfer is faster. It's like removing all the latency and all this other kind of stuff. It's negotiated oh, okay. by the network card and blah, blah, blah. But with RDMA transfers, you can actually execute like Spectre and Meltdown type things oh my over gosh. the network. <laughs> Because it's direct access to memory, and it's like, does it go through cache? Was it a cache thing, or is it just is it actually being loaded directly into memory? And so oh, the okay. remote machine can do stuff with that to create situations that can then be timed. And because RDMA is so low overhead and low latency, those the timing aspects of that attack come into play there. That's amazing. Uh, I don't like this computer. I'm gonna have scary. <laughs> I'm gonna have to do some some research on this because this, uh, yeah, RDMA stands for Remote Direct Ma Memory Access yeah. figure, and that looks super uh, exciting to say the least. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's good in theory because you know you can you got a big data set and you need to dump it into memory of another computer so that it can process it. That's that's a handy technology to have. However. <laughs> <laughs> so you oh, could do boy. remote row hammer yeah or uh oh yeah, there's there's uh the uh remote the... clipboard monitoring <laughs> <laughs> oh wow well i mean windows 10 already has that let's be honest yep That's microsoft stealing all your datas yeah i was gonna say uh wendell do you have any uh favorite uh cell phones or smartphones that that you can attest to uh i don't think we've ever um, achieved um, parity with uh, the ergonomics of the third or fourth generation T-Mobile Sidekick. Ooh. Oh, wow. Yeah, I forgot so, about that thing. <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you imagine a screen, an Android device that the screen flips like that and there's a thumb keyboard that is as comfortable as that? 
So I've got the FX Tech Pro One or the F- FX One or the FX Tech Pro One. I don't know. It's the Android keyboard. It's the Android phone with a keyboard that's a clamshell, a miniature laptop. I love it. The problem is that its keyboard is too wide to comfortably thumb. If it were the same size as the T-Mobile Sidekick and it were as easy to open the screen as the T-Mobile Sidekick, it would be a game changer. The second thing with phones is that I think people have got to think outside the box. Um, the, the next thing that needs to happen to think outside the box, Apple is like, it's like, a, it's like Mr. Magoo. Like I'm watching Apple like stumble around and do stuff with applications and they almost get it. They almost understand, but they don't realize that what people actually want is to seamlessly move between devices. Like yeah. as a design goal, that's not one of their design goals. Like Apple, like Steve Jobs was really good at like, no, I, my design goal is I have a finger. I want this thing to be good to use with a finger. And so relentlessly pursuing that, I mean, it, you know, it's on the one hand, you could, you could perhaps not unfairly say that, you know, he was just an idiot that was very powerful and was like, no, I must insist on actually. My, and then it was up to the brilliant people underneath him to be like, all right, how can we make him happy? He wants to use his, you know, fat little digit in order to you know, <laughs> navigate through the phone. And so mm-hmm. they built a, an actually good revolutionary interface for phones. That's what T-Mobile did. This is Java. This is so much better. This is the same Java that Android runs. And like yeah. Android fundamentally misunderstands what they're trying to do. Android is a platform built on lies. You know, it's like, oh, it's Java. It's a JVM. It's going to be safe. No, it's extracting no. your data way, way more than anybody else is. Mm-hmm. But this form factor in terms of like the seamlessness of it, I think Apple is accidentally going to get there before anybody else because you can, you got like iMessage and all the other stuff and you can seamlessly yeah. move between your laptop and your desktop and your whatever. So imagine if you're running apps. Imagine if you're running an app on your phone basically in a virtual machine and you can migrate that running container from your phone to a laptop or from your phone to a desktop or from your phone to your desktop for a little while. And then you got to go to lunch and you hit a button and then it goes back to your phone and you can keep the state of whatever you're working on, your documents, literally everything. And you do that through an application instead of a web API, it lives in an application. So the application is fast and it's responsive. You don't have the bullshit latency of like the 4G or the 5G network or the handoff to Wi-Fi and the little hiccup that happens when you do that because it lives in the application. Apple is building that without realizing it. But when they have that, people are going to be like, yeah, that's what I wanted. I want that. That's amazing because that's what the sidekick had. Hey, podcast editor Jack here. I am breaking in through the stream to tell you that I cut out a whole lot of things from that interview. Um, Pretty much all of it can be aired, um, but for the sake of time, we are moving on now to the extras in the same episode as the main podcast, mainly because the extras is where we actually talked about the news topics. So here we go. Here's the news. Okay, so... So, so uh, welcome to Extreme Hardware Podcast Extras. Uh, we are joined by our typical crew. Uh, yeah, Chris typical crew and this weirdo named Wendell. He seems kind of neat. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> All right. And, yep. Yeah, so we got Axifer, we've got Jack, we've got myself, Simmons, we've got Chris, and our special guest, Wendell. Yeah. Bonjour. Comment ça va? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Shut up, Axie. You don't use that language here. Je ne comprends pas l'anglais. All right. Je m'appelle Axie. So, we kick your asses in World War II. We'll do it again. <laughs> Simmons, thank you for your service. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Wendell. <laughs> Oh, no, uh, he's gonna kill us now. No, Wendell, for context, I'm in the military. And Chris takes every opportunity to abuse that saying. Yeah, he doesn't <laughs> like it when I say it for some reason. Gee, I wonder why Chris that I get this irrationally angry whenever you say. It. <laughs> well, there goes your security clearance. <laughs> oh uh, boy, very exciting. Um, <laughs> And that's anyway. this episode. Thanks for coming. Au revoir. <laughs> yeah, that, that's <laughs> <all we need. laughs> no, 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 no. All right. So, um, um, so Chris said that he wanted to, uh, to uh, talk about. Uh, so Chris is going to be coming down to my place uh, next week. Yeah. And so a, we were talking. Friend. We were talking about ways to get me to throw up, and Jack suggested just get me to vape 
pure nicotine. Um, Axie suggested to just spin me around and I would vomit. And you know what? That would probably work too. Wait, no, no Axie suggested. I'm sorry. You're you're right. I apologize. I'm putting words in your mouth, and I should not do that. Uh, Axie suggested that we get Simmons VR rig and we put it on me and we just drive around like that. And now I'm wondering just how much stuff his Civic can power. Well, like, so- can we put an entire gaming PC and have your Civic power it? And also, it still does zero to sixty in yes. Well, so so that's the thing. It's like uh, the 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 easy workaround is just getting an Oculus Quest because that's a standalone device. Yeah, but that's Facebook and get Google out. Google Cardboard. No, no, those are awful. They make me want to throw up when I'm sitting still. No, no, no. better. The reason why I bring up the Oculus Quest is because, um, especially with the Beat Saber stuff, um, somebody made a modded uh, beat map where you are actually required to strafe 60 meters to the left and then back to the right in order to pass it. (laughs) Why? Because because it's not a reason of why, but why not? I guess. Also, 60 meters, that's a lot of meters. Oh, yeah. No, the dude, uh, the dude in the video, he was uh, he was in some uh, warehouse parking lot to, to yeah. be able to, uh, to uh, pull it off. Oh, you know, what would be really illegal, but also really cool. <laughs> that's a good way to start any sentence. All right. So you take an RX-8 and you take a couple of. Go- no. Uh, <laughs> what you do is you get like a 360 degree camera. And okay. you mount it off the back of your car. So okay. it's kind of like up and over it. Um, but it, it's it's a 360 degree camera and you have to a VR system and you you drive your car like that. You're driving your car in third person. I mean, um, I think uh, William Osman and Michael Reeves did that where they set up a... Oh, shit, they did, didn't they? They were they did. driving in... I think one second latency. Yeah, yeah, it was with latency, but that wasn't from a third person perspective. And I think they were just using monitors, weren't they? Yeah, they had a monitor set up uh, in front of the steering wheel and they basically put a blackout curtain around the driver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> driver killed after hitting Parker. That's probably not it. Uh, Tom Scott, Tom Scott. I can't find it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Scott, that's someone else. Um, but uh, actually, so, so, since we didn't really get to touch on any of our articles, uh, we did have some articles that we wanted to to have some fun conversation about. Yeah, this uh, is the new extras. We're changing the game. <laughs> yeah. So uh, th- this very first one, uh, AMD learns from NVIDIA and issues guidelines to retailers to prevent uh, Radeon RX 6000 series uh, from being scalped. Yeah, uh, nobody's going to want to scalp it because it's Radeon. hey Yeah, That's so... Also they, fake news. Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. Because like I'm looking at this PDF that was provided, um, and it's like, oh yeah, you're just going to use bot detection. You're going to use captcha. You're going to introduce some purchase limits. Uh, there's going to be a reservation system implemented, and this is all suggestions. So none of this actually has to be enforced. <laughs> yeah, strongly Wait, recommended. Wendell, Wendell called it fake news. Is this even real, or can uh, you comment if you know? No, well, so like on the AMD side, okay, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, this is just basic stuff. But mm-hmm. the shortage on the NVIDIA side, NVIDIA is not making that many. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Didn't N- NVIDIA only ramp up production like a month or two before where AMD normally does at least a few months of production of stuff before most yeah. of their launches? Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, first of all, like, Jensen is not is is like a brilliant guy, ruthless, insanely brilliant, and he would know everything. And so, what on earth would possess him to scramble and launch before even board tar- board partners knew to be ready for launch? Like this is this is this is a a terrible terrible situation that is probably of Nvidia's own making. Um, where we've got the shortages in the production and did the production ramp up? What's going on with board partners and and all this other stuff? Like I've got I've got bots that have been trying to buy, but my bots are not super aggressive. They're basically just browser automation. And so, like yeah. Nvidia.com, like it's it's Nvidia.com is 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 well built by their agency or whatever. And the shop thing uses um, a lot of AJAX, 
And so that's really awesome. It's like the full digital river kit. It was not an inexpensive e-commerce platform to build. The problem with it is when they added the CAPTCHA, it was all JavaScript side. So like if you had a bot, it didn't, it didn't matter. There was nothing server side about handling the session or server side about handling the add to cart or whatever. So when you would add the cart, the card, the card to the cart, it would just give you a CAPTCHA before calling that API. But if you knew what API to call, you didn't even need to do the CAPTCHA. And so they, they finally realized that after like seven or eight cycles of, oh, wow, how are the, how are the bots able to add to cart? <laughs> and just gave up and said, hey, Best Buy, why don't you just do it for us? <laughs> which, which, is, which is hilarious. Because so NVIDIA not carrying their own product on their own website and just giving their stock to NVIDIA, that's the news. The news is they have so little inventory and so little ability to manage it that they have yeah. to hand it over to, drum roll, bestbuy.com yeah <laughs> yeah so oh, assuming that their yields are actually good and it's just because they have an actual low amount of inventory is there a chance that you think they might have launched as early as they did to try to get ahead of amd and potentially intel as much as they could knowing Nothing their customer really. base is going to basically jump at the next fastest graphics card Nothing is really like really makes sense in my head because, you know, if it we'll we'll have another data point once the 3070 launches, because if the 3070 launches yep. and it has a good quantity, then it's probably a problem with the memory and not the rest of the silicon. But yeah. if the 3070 doesn't launch the significant quantities, then it's probably a problem with Samsung's eight nanometer stuff. Now, the 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 pro cards. The Pro Ampere, that's actually already on TSMC's 7 nanometer process. So, you know, uh, they could which, just spool up. Which one? Do you mean GA100? Or... It, it's the the A6000. I don't know what the internal name is. Oh, the Quattro replacements? Yeah, yeah, those yeah. Are, those are using 7 nanometer. Yeah, yeah, TSMC. Yeah. Really? I didn't realize that. Okay. I must have missed that. So, I think they already have Ampere on the 7 nanometer process. It's just not in quantity. So, are we going to see like the 3080 Ti or 3070 Ti uh, in uh, like in a uh, launch quantity, I guess let's call it? Um, and if we do, is it going to be on the 7 nanometer process? Like, is that is that what's ramping? Because they canceled the 20 gig versions as well, which again makes no sense. Mm -hmm. There's a missing piece of data yeah. that's obvious. Uh, I mean, I think the, well, so why did they cancel the 20 gig version? I mean, that would suggest memory chips, I think, because right now, GDDR6X, the reason that they can't do uh, like the full 48 gigs on it is because the density is half that of GDDR6. So I would think that's kind of the limiting factor uh, myself. So <laughs> one, they got to use uh, Quenchel mode for the time being. That doesn't fit all of the available data, but I, I will concede that that is the best fit for available data because when, do you remember when um, Vega launched and the, the HBM memory was kind of underclocked and then there was a little bit of a kerfuffle because it was like, hey, is this Samsung memory or is this another memory? And the higher clock memory was suffering from electron migration immediately. What if this oh. product launch mm -hmm. is oh, a launch yeah. to see if they are going to experience electron migration in any significant quantities? And so it's not really any manufacturing problem or any other problem. It's just that if there is a manufacturing problem, which maybe some of their internal data hints at, when you get enough of these in the wild, you'll have enough data points to make the determination as to whether or not there's an electron migration problem. On the other hand, I don't think the clock speed is that much higher than GDDR6 just because it's I mean, the higher bus rate is because it's using PAM4 signaling. Like, that's... Are the internal clocks faster as well, like, within the memory chips, or...? No idea. <laughs> I didn't look into it enough to know for sure. It could yeah. also be something as simple as, like, you know, they have to do a lot of extra tooling on the printed circuit boards, and maybe there's just, like, a team of 12 guys that are the guys that are responsible for making the actual PCBs. Because the board partners, don't they have to buy the PCBs? Like, didn't... what did what, like there wasn't like a JJ from Asus or something said something ridiculous. Like they got to buy the PCBs and then desolder it, solder it onto their own PCBs. Oh really? Yeah, that's normal. Yeah. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> I don't know if that's still true, but it seems like some AIB partner was complaining about that a couple of years ago on like the on like the nine hundred series. Mm -hmm. 
I can would that allow that. NVIDIA just to better test all the chips on a known PCB that they can easily test and then just send that out and say, here, you deal with it now? Oh, they got to have like dedicated BGA testers for that. Oh, it depends on where it's coming from and yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't actually think it's done that way anymore, except for maybe smaller AIB partners. I think it is just trays of chips, but I think at one point it was like you get the circuit board and the chip and then you're responsible for putting everything else on there. Mm. Mm. See, now I have this wonderful like vision of this this poor AIB that has to purchase all these like founders edition cards if we're using current uh, terminology and they just have this specialty jig set up to basically desolder every single component from the, <laughs> uh, the GPU so they can just reuse them and whatever form factor or layout they decide they want to do <laughs> no no it was just it wasn't everything was soldered on it was just well, the dpu no yeah. I, I i i yeah no i just i just like thinking in that extreme though <laughs> yeah so I, I pulled up the specs for the uh the a6000 and the a40 i why did they kill off the quadro brand that's just silly uh but either way both of them are gddr6 not x because well i mean why would they be because that's the only way to get 48 gigabytes uh in addition the memory clock uh, 16 gigabit per second and 14.5 gigabit per second, which seems rather slow. What's the 3070 supposed to do? Because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really thinking that uh, memory clock is probably it. Uh, do we have this tech power up? Thank you. It, this exists in the database, but it's not out there. Uh, oh yeah, Jack said the same thing of the 3070. The 3070 indicator will be of an indicator of what's at fault for the availability of the 3090. Yeah. It's definitely yeah. another data point. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's just really odd all around how the launch was so baffled with such low stock. It's not even the bots, it's the fact that they were just so low stock, even still. I also like the blatant dishonesty of oh, it's the it's the bots that are buying all the cards. And it's like clearly there's a production problem here. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, the bots are buying all of the cards. There's like ten of them. <laughs> <laughs> And I think the it's funny like, it's thing. like basically early Teslas is what it seems like right now. It seems like first oh, orders gosh. of Teslas, every new model is what's happening with NVIDIA. It's like, let's get this out, get the hype up. And then, oh, shit, we got a bunch of people who want it and we don't have enough to actually fulfill all those products. But yeah. The difference is I want to buy a graphics card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've been in the Tesla and I can't say I want one. It's I don't know how they sell for as much as they do because... I mean, because they're electrics, I guess, because the interior is, I mean, I wouldn't put a Civic interior as worse than a Tesla. I'd probably prefer the Civic interior because it actually has knobs and stuff you can yeah. actually use and actual proper stitching and actual panels to line up. Yeah, I, I really hope Tesla becomes irrelevant and other companies do the EV thing better. Like they, they can do, go do their, their solar power crap. Well, that or if Tesla sells their platform for right. people to use. Eh, questionable. I don't know. But yeah, uh, that, that would be, that'd be something. So, uh, so um, I suppose uh, the, the next thing I wanted to bring up was, uh, so with the 3070, uh, the, uh, the launch date was changed uh, to, October 29th, and that's not really a news item. I think what really is the news item is what is the significance of October 29th? On October 28th is going to be the AMD announcement for the RX 6000 series GPUs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so there's going to be a lot of hype for this because uh, everybody is looking forward to seeing AMD maybe p compete with the 3070. Oh, they won't. <laughs> I, I refuse to believe anything. I, like, the last time, the last time Radeon even kind of delivered was the 290 and the 290X, yep. but that launch was kind of ruined because the um, the coolers, if I remember correctly, were like upscaled from Tahiti. Mm -hmm. They were not designed for Hawaii, so the things ran at like 90 degrees stock, unless you turned on the Uber profile, and then they would stop throttling and be slightly faster. And then, oh, okay. Hey, aftermarket boards are available, and everybody's mining Litecoin now. So, yeah, yeah that that was a time. Um, I guess the seventy nine seventy was good for a little bit, <laughs> but then two months later, Nvidia comes out with the six eighty, 
which is faster and cooler and cheaper and forced AMD to cut prices and release the, uh, the gigahertz edition that wasn't even as fast as the 680. And that was the last time they like, that, that was it. First gen GCN. No, no so well, the 7970 the was, I would argue that the 7970 had a longer lifetime than the 600 series GPUs. Oh, Nvidia. don't get me started on fine wine. <laughs> fine, all, here's the deal. All fine wine means is AMD kept releasing driver updates to get performance to where it could have been when it was new. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's, that's, we should we should have yeah, had it I mean, in the first place. <laughs> that's probably not a completely unfair way to look at it. But uh, one thing that I am excited about with the release of new GPUs uh, is that it's not a complete do over of microarchitecture again. Because <laughs> think about like right yeah. now the current situation right now the situation with the drivers and some of the shenanigans with the drivers. I mean they're kind of supporting Polaris and Vega. And Navi, and so it's like, Ew. oh my god, yeah, it's a mess. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think AMD is going to have like four different APUs floating around, like Zen two and Zen three APUs. In oh, the same I generation. don't like that. Uh, this I, gen is going to be uh, Vega graphics. Next gen is going to be Navi. I don't remember if it's our DNA one or two. Doesn't really matter, but it's going to be after Vega. But well, like. Just all of this stuff floating around. Why are they mixing APU architectures, by the way? That's really stupid and ambiguous. And I, do we have Oland? Of, do we have Oland on Zen 2? Oh, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so like the system that's right behind me right now is a Ryzen 7 4750G. And that's Vega 8. And yeah. Ryzen 5 3400G is Vega 11. The Vega yeah. 8 in the 4750G is actually faster for most things than yeah, the Vega 11 uh, in the 3400G. It, it clocks better and some other things I think have, have, have been optimized in the, in the dive around the memory controller because the faster yeah. the faster the memory, the better the situation is. Yeah. Um, oh, trust think, me. I've used an AP before. And I think that's probably why. Not Navi. Maybe not. So we were, Jeff and I were doing some work on Looking Glass and, um, if you if you get a Navi card to do really terrible things, uh, it, <laughs> it, it seems to become more. It seems to become an APU, and so it's like, wait, what? What's going on? I mean, we can't boot it or initialize it or anything, but when you do really terrible things to the the GPU, it seems to almost be like it wants to be an APU. So maybe AMD is doing something clever with the silicon there, and those are like pre 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 test products because you know the I/O die. And the chipset, those are the same. Those are literally the same. They're just packaged yeah. differently. And so it's like, are they doing that with GPUs as well? Oh, yeah, for X570. Dude, I, they missed such an opportunity with X570. They could have, like, enabled a memory channel and just had, like, oh, here's an extra SODEM slot. Here's an onboard RAM disk. That would have been so neat. Also <laughs> probably really difficult to implement. So, yeah, sure. I understand. <laughs> I want it. I, I think the, the, there are five customers on planet Earth that really would have appreciated that feature. Yeah, I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you would have appreciated it, but what would you what, what would you specifically have done with that, Chris? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Stuck, stick my browser on it so it goes if, fast. If any, and if anything, if anybody is going to manufacture this product, I imagine Supermicro to put that out in two years. <laughs> Ooh, you know what? You know, we've still got like the the occasional trickle of like persistent DRAM storage devices, I guess Optane's probably going to kill that because they're mainly for data center. Because, like, you know, you had the IRAM all those years ago. You had that one DDR2 drive that was kind of sort of dead on arrival that I played with last year. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You've got, what was it? It was like the all-one cloud drive or something. I think it's a Taiwanese company. There is nothing about them on the internet. Like they just don't exist. And I want to purchase one of their things. It was a DDR3 era, uh, but like a PCI Express adding card with a bunch of SODEMs. Um, so I'm wondering, like, can we get an NVMe drive that just has like a micro SD slot for backups and a bunch of SODEMs on it? We're going to take this concept to uh, the next level, the next so era. It's it's really crazy, but you will probably be able to buy hobby kits to do exactly this in the in the next couple of years, because literally every interconnect is going to PCI Express. There is nothing 
with PCI Express. Even server to server interconnects, it's PCI Express. Things in your phone, yeah. your, like your cell phone connection, like the camera and the storage and whatever, PCI Express. Literally every interface is going to PCI Express. So you're going to be able to download ready-made IP for like an FPGA. I mean, yeah, you're going to be spending like $600 for the development kit. You can pick up an Altera FPGA you know, dev kit, download the PCI Express interface. And if you want to build you know, a SODIM thing to uh, PCI Express, you can just Lego that together with some pre-existing intellectual property and, and yes. uh, totally do that. And it's not going to be a big deal. That's actually really exciting. I need to learn how to use FPGAs. I thought about it a while ago, and then I looked at some tutorials, oh, and I got scared and overwhelmed. Oh, <laughs> actually, that would be useful for a... Uh useful for professional reasons because uh, analytical chemistry is really neat and I could make like, I could probably get it to do like sensory stuff. Uh, I mean, this Chris, is a good idea. It's funny that Wendell brings up the fact that so much stuff has moved to PCI Express because you and me have talked or you and I oh, USB have talked 4, a lot USB 4 as about well. using M.2 slots that have PCI Express lanes for a bunch of other random add-in cards like those SATA ones or <laughs> yeah. Converted to other lanes or other yeah. random devices that you can build in. Like the M.2 form factor is just great. PCI Express yeah. for everything is just Honestly. great. Even the Raspberry no, like, Pi 4 compute module, it has a PCI Express 1x slot. That's yeah, Gen so 2.0, to, but still. So you, so you don't have to PCI take Express a, uh, on a cheap computer that can do yeah. the entire home automation. Plus, oh, here also have whatever, a 10 gig network card or something and connect to your home surveillance <laughs> network. Yeah, it's cool. Um, dude, 10 gig on a Raspberry Pi, that would actually make it... Uh, I don't know. The 10 gig card would cost twice as much as the computer. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Um, I lost my train of thought. No, uh, USB 4 is also supposed to do that. No, the thing with M2 is that electronics are just so miniaturized and everything's going to mobile anyway that like there's no reason that any of these circuits need a full-size add-in card you should just be able to have a bunch of m2 slots on a motherboard you would be able to fit more stuff on them and then you wouldn't need to do that because well everything's integrated now but like yeah it's neat um well imagine an m2 an m.2 chipset because most chipsets are just four pci lanes anyway Imagine that no, um, DMI. it was just an M.2 slot that was your new chipset link. You can just put it whatever chipset you want yeah. on your board. No, the uh, the DMI link in um, uh, Intel CPUs, that can be used as a PCI Express by 4 link. Like, Intel mm -hmm. allows that. It's in the manual. Uh, it's just a custom... Oh, crap, I forgot the word for it. But it's like... Basically, firmware that you can patent... Not firmware, like signaling protocol stuff that you can patent. So other people, such as NVIDIA, can't make their own chipsets. And even then, I'm pretty... Well, no, that was, uh, that was QPI. Never mind. That was something else. Uh, and then if you look at the, uh, the APU chipsets from AMD, um, I don't think there's anything special about their so-called UMI link at all because the same APUs that are connected to those chipsets and like FM2 motherboards... Well, you can also just go completely chipsetless and use a stripped down uh, Southbridge that's contained within the APU die. Uh, Carrizo started that one back in 2015. Um, so, yeah, no, you, why can't you do that? That would be good. And it's not like um, AMD is unwilling to use third parties because we saw them use as media um, for. Uh, really most of their chipsets until x570 i guess and that was because i don't think as media had a pcie4 uh, ip available hmm. remember so, when we were going to talk about articles <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is always how it goes <laughs> yeah so actually, this next article um i actually found this one so i'm gonna let him take it away uh yeah it's so, nothing super crazy here but i guess uh uh, Michael over at Pharonix posted this, but they had found, I guess, in the latest DRM driver for Linux, um, an NVIDIA, or sorry, not NVIDIA, a Navi 10 blockchain SKU line in the driver, oh, which yeah. would imply a potentially headless 
Navi 10 GPU, whether it's the 5500 or 5700 equivalent, but specifically for blockchain. And I guess what's more interesting is if you can get SRIOV to work or virtualization, this could be a pretty handy machine, something to run a Windows VM for Looking Glass on, let's say, or something like I that. I feel like AMD is going to try to lock that out, but also that there's going to be a relatively easy hack that will re-enable it. Uh, I, it's not so like I've had a lot of conversations, you know, on and off the record, and I don't I don't want to say too much, but um. AMD actually does want people to try to use like all of the weird, like un unuse case use cases. They actually do kind of go out of their way to try and support that. But there's like the problem with Navi is that the hardware design literally doesn't consider doing a PCIe reset in the context and vernacular of like the actual PCIe standard. And so like literally just restarting the card is a huge pain in the ass for no reason other than just nobody thought of it. And so I really so what's hope that quick, just quickly on that, Wendell, that was one of the follow-ups, but what is the last AMD GPU that actually properly supported that soft reset function? I, like from what I remember, it was like, I want to say the Fury was the last card I used in a build that properly supported the soft reset without having to restart the entire host machine. Uh, Polaris works fine in uh, all of the all of the Polaris cards that I've gotten my hands on, which is a huge number of Azrock and Sapphire cards. The Sapphire cards have the most polished BIOS because um, they've been qualified in Max, and Max, hmm. if anything is even slightly wrong, the Mac doesn't work. And so Sapphire has done a lot of work to qualify it for the Mac, and as a result, it worked well in, in those contexts. That is um, interesting. Um, but yeah, no, Vega has got problems and Navi has got problems. I really hope they fix it in this generation. But like, you know, Stadia, like the thing that Google is running, obviously Google is not having a problem resetting these GPUs. They probably have some I kind of management that. engine for doing stuff. And so it's like, how do you deal with this? Well, again, Jeff on the forum and some of the other work that, that we've done, uh, we reset it by using the power management chip. Like... <laughs> We literally use the VRMs to reboot the processor, which You're is just insane. Like, are you just like wow. power cycling the graphics chip itself? Yes, that is exactly <laughs> what we're doing. <laughs> so okay, does that need so like <laughs> does that need like PCIe hot plug support to also be enabled, or does it work on most machines? It just happens to work on most machines. Needless to say, like <laughs> Alex Williamson and those guys are like, uh, "You're doing what now? No, we can't accept that into the kernel." <laughs> And it's like, I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I mean, maybe if somebody <laughs> from AMD would look at that and be like, oh, we kind of need this in the kernel. And then they would be like, well, I mean, this wouldn't be the first time the Linux kernel has supported hardware that was on fire and broken. Okay. I mean, again, <laughs> but we're just some randos that are saying, hey, we're rebooting the car by, by jiggling the PRM, basically. <laughs> uh, can we get it? So the patch... It's not perfect either because different implementations from different vendors implement stuff differently, as you might imagine. And so it doesn't even necessarily work, you know, from card to card because the vendors may change something in the card or they may tweak something. And so and you that's to, why I try to buy reference. <laughs> yeah. You, you, well, you have to fiddle with the thing a little bit. And if you use the patch and you fiddle with it, you can get it working. The problem is you have to also be a programmer and comfortable moving around the kernel and then you can use it. But it's like, come on, guys. I know that like Google Stadia is not going to go through this to try to reset their GPUs. There's got to be something that's less insane than this. <laughs> Just out of that is crazy. <laughs> I mean, I it's interesting that there is I fixes for it. So but... Much. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's completely unintentional. It is 100% unintentional. They mean well, and they really like AMD. Really does want people to use their products. It's just not a use case. That they had really considered and um you know supposedly these new nvidia gpus support SRIOV. i think you know i think one of the reasons well i mean it's maybe a lot of reasons but you know the way that nvidia has historically treated virtualization hasn't been great and when that news broke i was like no they, they miscommunicated this, this is broken and so some of the people in the press were like no i verify they said that SRIOV is supported blah blah, blah. And i was like just nope not not happening and then sure enough, it was like, nope, 
not not a thing from NVIDIA on their on their new GPUs. It is like how insane is it that we have so much good hardware ex- extensions for running virtualization and para virtualization going back ten generations in CPUs, and here mm. today, right now, in GPUs, we still don't have it, and we are still being bitten by basic computer science problems in GPUs, like the whole uh, GPU aware scheduling. And the whole uh, Apex Legends thing, where if you're using OBS to capture, OBS and Apex Legends are fighting because ABS, Apex Legends has higher priority. There's not a, such a thing as a task manager where you can be like, hey, OBS needs higher priority in order to be able to capture because Apex is going to use whatever GPU resources you've got available, no matter what you got, even if it doesn't really need it, because that's the way the game engine is written. That, and so, that, that, no, you keep, keep going. I'll remember. And so it's like, you know, fundamentally, those are like 101 level computer science problems that were solved with really tiny, insignificant hardware extensions more than 10 generations ago. And it's like, can we can we please have virtualization on GPUs? But I I guess, you know, like the economic, you know, thing of, oh, we don't want to enable cloud gaming or make it easier for the data center stuff because it might eat into our data center revenue. There's just so much paranoia and misunderstanding at the executive level of those things that we can't have a forward momentum in technology. That's actually something, uh, speaking of revenue, that I've noticed with, like, graphics cards, right? Because, like, if you look at a Quadro, you know, okay, here's the GeForce card, it's a thousand bucks, here's the Quadro, it's, oh, I don't know, six thousand dollars, and you maybe get VRAM. Meanwhile, if you look at CPUs, Xeon and Core are priced about the same. Like, maybe it's off by about a hundred bucks, but a six core Xeon, six core Core chip, they're going to cost about the same. Um, so there's not really that risk of cannibalizing sales because they're not relying on uh, just selling them at ridiculous markups for effectively the same thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you think it's partly a problem that? Uh, there's no real standardized GPU architecture in the sense that, like, like do do these ISAs change that frequently? Because obviously AMD and NVIDIA are using very different things. Um, well, that's that's the promise of SROV, single root IO virtualization. It would leave it up to the hardware to decide how to handle that. Intel went a completely different way with GVT, but they open sourced it. And so, like, yeah, at least as far mm-hmm. as I can tell, there's not really not only is it open source, there's no intellectual and property encumbrance like, you know, patents or crap like that on Intel's GVT. AMD did actually add some extensions in this latest round of AMD GPU updates. They added some extensions to be able to have user different competing user processes running on a GPU, which looks like the beginning of para, para virtualization support that is more robust and less like it's a different layer, basically, than, than SRIOV, and it would be more convenient from, from an application standpoint. Maybe some of this should be the responsibility of the operating system, but I think that we need the hardware extensions. And, and yeah, how each vendor implements it will matter a whole bunch, but uh, all of the graphics card companies have been scared to death of, of eating into their data center revenue because that's a captive audience. They will literally pay anything because they're making money with the computers, and whoever has the fastest computer wins. And they're making a lot of money. So you can basically charge whatever you want if your thing's faster. Hmm. Yeah. Jack, uh, you had something to talk about. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, something. yeah. Um, when, you, when you were talking about the Apex Legends thing and OBS, uh, the, I, I, this doesn't have to do with virtualization or anything, but uh, the GPU priority thing, like when I'm recording uh, my work in uh, Unreal Engine 4 and I use OBS and this is an important detail. One of my monitors is on 100, 120 hertz and the other one's on 60 hertz. And if I use OBS, you get dropped frames, weird things whenever RTX gets engaged and then everything just is really slow in the recording. But if you use shadow play, fine. And it, I, I, don't, I, I don't know how shadow play is more deep into the drivers, and, but I, I know OBS uses a different implementation of Envy Inc. And yeah, it's weird. <laughs> it's a time. <laughs> it's well, also terrific and scary. So yeah. I've, I've got a nice parallel to that, actually. So um, I think Andrews was watching uh, one of my streams the other day, and mm-hmm. he, was, um, he was watching you know, a Twitch stream 
in Firefox and he was getting a lot of drop frames and a lot of weird stuttering. And then the moment that he's like, oh, oh, I know what my problem is. It's because my monitor is clocked at 120 hertz. Yeah, and yeah. That, that happened when I was watching your Twitch stream, too. I, I was like, dude, you're dropping frames. And it just had to do with my refresh rate. And for some reason, Twitch doesn't like that. Weird. Yeah. But then the moment you flip over the Chrome, it's fine. <laughs> for me, it was bad on everything. Oh, well, OK, maybe you're just special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you are. Yeah, the I, abstraction I, layers, there's there's holes in the abstraction layers. So I'm not sure about Jack's like OBS problem exactly, but there is there is a, a similar thing that I encountered that I debugged and it was down to um so like when you're a software developer, you get the software developer tip from NVIDIA, you agree to a whole bunch of things and sign over mm -hmm. your kidney and your firstborn and whatever. And that's but I don't want to make play. That's like <laughs> the that's like the the pleb tier interface, and it's basically okay. But like Steam has access to a lot more functionality in the driver that is completely undocumented. So like Steam has stuff in it that can uh, windowless, bordered window, full screen capture uh, from the game. And it uses the same API and extensions that you normally only have access to the Quadro. So your application has to identify itself to the, uh, the NVIDIA uh, SDK as if it were Steam and then all of a sudden, a huge amount of functionality far beyond what you get as, you know, the normal plug here. Yes, oh, is enabled wow. and everything works way better. So like the Steam in-home streaming and all that kind of stuff uses a different path in the driver than like pleb tier developers will be able to use. And so I don't know if the OBS plugin is the pleb tier plugin or if NVIDIA has pulled them, you know, behind the curtain and said, hey, you don't have to use the pleb tier stuff. You can use the good stuff. Interesting. That's insane. So, <laughs> Wendell, is that related in any way to that uh, unofficial patch that floats around for people running mostly Plex, but who want more than two transcode streams on a regular GeForce card that normally you need a Quadro card to get, but the regular GeForce card can more than handle four 1080p streams on, let's say, like a GTX 1050 Ti? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is market segmentation because, again, this is all the same silicon. This is all, you're buying... You're buying the luxury car with the heated seats. It's just you are the driver. buying a spec sheet. Yeah, the driver literally does not enable the heated seats unless you have the Quadro. And that's how it works. <laughs> hmm. Oh, God. I. Mm. Oh, that's insane. I, I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, like no, no, because now I'm wondering that if, if you could maybe get your hands on like that, say that a special Plex driver or that special Steam integration and you can just bypass it to trick it into thinking it's using uh, X or Y and then everything just magically works better <laughs> with proper you know, handling on the, the, the programming level. Hopefully, uh, yeah. One, one of my favorite virtualization setups ever was the uh, RT, or GTX 690. That's two GPUs on one card. It is trivial to modify the, uh, the EEPROM on the card to, to make half the card a Quadro. And when you do that, you can load the Quadro drivers, but you can also have the game drivers. So you get really great game performance <laughs> and all of the Quadro options. And if you use Linux, you can use one of the GPUs as a VFIO pass-through because the PLX bridge will honor IOMMU separation. So one, <laughs> one, one physical card, two GPUs, one for Linux, one oh. for Windows. It is glorious. It is amazing. That is oh. incredible. Speaking, speaking of dual GPUs and just my horrible ideas so okay <laughs> you know the uh the god what was it called the uh the the radeon pro ssg right yes that vega card with the two m2 slots on it well it's just a plx chip except instead of hooking up to two gpus it hooks up to one gpu and a couple oh of i know where you're going with this i like it so obviously we can do something like have some M2 adapters so we get general purpose PCI Express slots. I asked Brax about this years ago and he said, yeah, that should probably work. <laughs> and what if we took a different um, something else, like let's say a 690, we desolder one of the GPUs, we find all of the PCI Express pins and we attach a riser to it and now we're, we, we just have an extra by 8 slot. I don't know why we need the by eight link now, but like they make this already. 
it's available in the enterprise. So like you can, you can <laughs> yeah, you can take a, a PCI X16 slot or two for 32 lanes and take it into an external enclosure and it'll be like oh, okay. 16 slots. And so you can just put whatever you want in there. And yeah. It works fine. Yeah. Cause you used to be able to get PLX chips for cheap, but then Broadcom bought them out and it's like, well, we're going to make money off data center. And they just disappeared from consumer motherboards. I think, uh, Z77 was probably the last one where they were really common. After that, they just disappeared overnight. And See, it, it sucks. I don't like it. So, yeah. so Chris, uh, that tangent that you took with the, uh, with the modified card was not what I was expecting because absolutely what I was expecting you to say is, yeah, you just take this modified uh, SSG and then you slap on your M.2 to PCI adapter and then you put another SSG on top of it. And then That's you just what I thought you were going to do. do that. Yeah, you can do that too. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, see, but it's, I thought you were going somewhere else with that too, which is the whole like direct IO thing for consoles, but see, that's going to open up like security researchers right now are salivating or I can see the drool forming around the edges of their mouth right now, because if you give the GPU direct access to the storage, that's going to be a whole other vector for things to be able to read from storage that maybe shouldn't be able to in terms of like that security context and since steam is so good at quality control this will of course not be a problem <laughs> yeah i mean can you imagine like the malware is in my gpu reading my ssh keys from my disk what <laughs> yeah, i'm not gonna lie when i first read about the direct access to ssds i completely thought from the security point of subconsciously that it meant oh you've got two m.2 slots on your motherboard one of the chips at one of the cpu one of those you're going to dedicate specifically to games. And when the game installs itself, it's going to install a full set of the textures to the second SSD that's only for the NVIDIA card to access. And that's where I thought they were going with this to prevent that issue of being able to read <laughs> the rest of your files from the driver level. Yeah, which... that would be smart. <laughs> uh, you get into a weird situation, but it's a good situation in that PCIe actually was designed for device to device communication. It's just that not a lot of people implemented. I think it's on Power, like Power PC. Um, I think it's implemented there. Although I think that um, they've, when you need to do that, there are other buses other than PCI Express that are better for that. That's part of the whole open hardware thing. I, I have think, to think about um, that for a second. I think that was AMD's big thing with uh, XDMA when they revised Crossfire, so it would stop using the bridges. It's just you, you don't need yeah. these anymore. They communicate directly over the bus, but other than that, I'm not aware of anything. Yeah, so I mean, that literally is a thing that goes back to Polaris, and they stubbed that out. They stubbed the functionality for that out in the Linux driver. They just never actually finished it, um, hmm. at least that I'm aware of. But it was fascinating because that was one of the vectors that Jeff and I were looking at or um, copying stuff to the other GPU it was like, can could we get to a point where we're copying stuff from the VRAM on one GPU through the PCIe bus to the VRAM on another GPU, and we don't even have to touch main memory because main memory is too slow when you're talking about you know yeah. 120 FPS at 4K. So I, I want to transition to this next article because unfortunately um, I got a little, uh, once you get into the technical stuff, especially on the software side, I get a little bit uh, lost. <laughs> so my apologies, but it's super fascinating hearing that. But uh, so a couple of weeks ago, we talked about um, uh, Facebook and the Oculus, uh, the Oculus VR hardware. And, you know, several years ago, Facebook brought Oculus and they're like, oh, don't worry. Uh, you know, we're going to just keep Oculus doing how they do, and we knew that was going to be a straight apply. And then, short, uh, shortly, or within the past month, they uh, they made a big push to the Oculus software that says, "Oh yeah, you must have a linked Facebook account uh, in order to use the hardware." Now, sorry guys, <laughs> um, and now uh, a new development has occurred where uh, if you delete the linked account that you used for your Oculus account, um, you lose. All of the games in your entire library. It just goes into the Aether. <laughs> I believe this also includes... Would this also include if your Facebook account gets banned? Did they clarify that? Um, I think so. I, I think there was a post that if, you, if your account gets banned or you deactivate your account, it would actually delete all your Oculus data. 
You can't run yeah. a Facebook account deactivated just to run Messenger. You won't have access to Oculus if you do that, and you would delete your data. Is what it implied from the Facebook warnings. Yeah, that that seems like a problem. Um, Facebook isn't very good. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, though I think you're preaching to the choir on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I I just didn't ex. I mean, I should have expected something to go this south with the uh, with the uh, the acquisition. I just didn't, didn't expect it to be this blatantly offensive. <laughs> and I don't know why. Maybe I was just trying to be uh, blissfully ignorant. Why would you give Facebook the benefit of the doubt? <laughs> Man, I, I don't even know anymore. This year is just kind of skewed a lot of things <laughs> yeah. Facebook is a website that started because mark zuckerberg got horny in college and now it's just eroding democracy in real time it's really cool how yeah. a website can do that <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and and honestly it's really disappointing because like that oculus quest 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 oh that's 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 great yeah um, the quest yeah, too <laughs> uh is a really interesting piece of hardware because it's a self-contained VR platform. Essentially, it just requires an internet connection and a, de- a decent amount of battery life, and you're and you're basically good. Right, to play a Facebook account. <laughs> well, yeah, that that especially, and like 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 I mentioned, uh, I think pre-recording with the uh, the uh, the Beat Saber mod map that that you actually have to strafe to the left sixty meters and then back to the right sixty meters in order to pass. Um, I mean, that standalone VR headset that plays you know your standard games is actually really fascinating and it's unfortunate that it's bound to facebook <laughs> yeah i just don't understand why exactly vr headsets need like accounts in the first place well that's the thing is like if you get your index it, it, it's just using your steam library if you get your htc vive it uses your steam library or the htc uh platform if you opt to use that instead uh, oh, right, but why does it need these platforms in the first place? I, I've I'm not I've never been clear on that. It's game library licensing at that point. <sighs> but I mean, I mean, you can launch like any game that just wants to use VR, and then you're yeah, using okay. VR. Uh, yes, yeah. that's the important bit. If it yeah. can just be used as a piece of hardware, fine. Okay, sure. But it's once you need an account to use hardware, I. I don't understand. It's the same reason like Razor is on my bad list because well, it does things in program files because oh, if you're not using Razor Sen apps. Like, go well, what you're, what you're suggesting would basically be like, okay, for the index, that would be kind of like uh, having a Windows driver that wasn't attached to Steam that could do all of the configuration and everything because yeah, that yeah, doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah, it's yeah. good. I don't know. I I, I feel like there's third party projects for the index, especially where you can actually just do that. You can just use it as as a standalone monitor and just do your own VR stuff in your own environment. Uh, So so yeah, basically, you aim with the index just functions as a monitor with a lot of sensors on it. So yeah, yeah. There's nothing blocking it. Correct. And the important thing. And I think the Vive is actually really similar in that regard as well because it still has the same exact integration into Steam VR and Open VR. So I mean, the functionality is there. It's just the, the, the Oculus stuff is so shoehorned behind Facebook uh, yeah. red tape at this point. It's, it's not a pleasant platform anymore. Yeah. I, 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 do, I do get a lot of enjoyment, though, out of people complaining and then, well, wanting the Quest or the Quest 2 and then liking it and then complaining. It's like, well, you knew what you were getting into, right? Were you listening to all of the people? Well, but yeah. that's the that's the yeah. issue, right? It's like because the barrier to entry to getting into VR is so expensive right now. So like that is like yeah. some people's sole option. Mm-hmm. So they really want to play, they accept the risk, and then they can start complaining about the risk that they accepted. So Yeah. Have we just like all given up uh kind of collectively on the Google cardboard concept? Because I'm not even seeing those crappy little plastic head mount displays in Goodwill anymore. Like, like, Google did just Google abandoned that like a it, month or two well, ago. They did? Well, I don't mean Google Cardboard precisely. I mean that kind of own case that straps to your face. I don't know. I have one. Like, they might have. They're, they're all effectively the same. Cardboard is just the most obviously cheap of them all. 
Um, I mean, they don't work for Simmons or me because our eyes are too far apart. Hey. <laughs> I, like, I tried one once and I wanted to throw up within minutes of using it. Like, they're not good. And I, I don't know. I, I, I would bet that that's turned a lot of people off from VR as a concept just so, because, well, if this isn't good, then why should I spend $1,000 on a proper setup? My first exposure to privately owned VR was actually a coworker of mine's uh, Google Cardboard setup that he had with his uh, Galaxy Note. So obviously the screen was big enough to handle it, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, the game was this little, just like, it looked like one of those uh, mobile game, um, like uh, uh, space flight simulators, essentially. And yes, the graphics were deplorable, but the, as a concept, the moment that you put on the headphones and then you're just in that realm, it, you kind of just get used to it. Um, I didn't have a negative experience and I was like, oh, this is actually super exciting. I can actually see where, you know, the uh, the vibe is coming from or now the index and stuff along those lines. And I, I've been very sold on it. Uh, yeah. Aside from the fact that my eyes are too wide for my index. But hey, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they are funny. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, for context, Wendell, um, there's a, there's that adjustable. Post some selfies. You know what? No, I'll post some selfies. <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, there's a there's a, a lens field or a, like eye width slider, and it goes up to a 70 degree um, angle at a maximum. And even at that 70 degree angle, it's just slightly not wide enough for <laughs> my my horribly deformed face. <laughs> well, that was uh, Palmer Lucky had the same problem. That was he he raised a, a, a huge stink about that because he was like, "I'm the founder of this, and you're telling me, you know, blah blah blah," because. They only uh, did the adjustment on those for um, it's like two standard deviations of the U.S. population. So there's a that between second and third standard deviation. There's there's kind of a lot of people in that in that thing. Yeah, two Correct. standard yep. deviations is going to leave out five percent, which is a lot actually. That's, and likely uh, most of the tech uh, people that want to buy it. Yeah, million people. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it, including it, it, Palmer Lucky, the guy that came <laughs> up with it originally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, just if the mechanism. I mean, I don't care if the the headset's just maybe a, a centimeter or two wider. I just want to be able to look at this without the weird angle glare and tell my <laughs> thanks, Chris. <laughs> uh, God. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. It's like I mean. I, I will give it some benefit of the doubt because yes, it is an absolute issue, especially when I'm first getting into VR. But the moment I play this or playing something that's just me, uh, for me mentally intensive, like Beat Saber, you know, playing these very fast ones, you kind of just like mentally tune it out until at some point you start sweating a little bit, and then your lens starts fogging off, and then you're self aware that uh, your eyes are still too freaking wide for the damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so on a totally unrelated note, Wendell, if given the option, would you rather have like you're just handed a bowl and a spoon. Would you rather this bowl be full of unsweetened whipped cream or of sweetened condensed milk? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, no, this is, the way, this is he, he's trying to qualify something here. Just answer the question. <laughs> unsweetened whipped cream or, or sweetened condensed milk. Or sweetened sweetened condensed milk. I think I could use the sweetened condensed milk to make banana pudding. So it's maybe God damn it. you have you have the bad opinion who deleted that. <laughs> you know who deleted that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, the, for the context, um, there was one day I was just craving something sweet, and the only thing I had was sweetened condensed milk. So I just got a spoon and went to town, <laughs> and then I got a one day, day, huh? Uh, oh, one. one. Well, I mean, I don't go grocery shopping every day. I had to wait until the end of the week to go pick up my sweets. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Excuses. <laughs> Needless to say, there was a big, there was a big Twitter call out post about it, and that was my favorite Twitter drama of this year. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's also the room temperature butter. Well, you're yeah. just wrong about that. <laughs> I'll fight you. That's how butter is stored. Well, I'll yeah. fight you too. You guys obviously haven't researched me at all because my big Twitter controversy this year was my toilet lid collection. <laughs> Dude, oh my god! Awesome. Yes, yeah. I saw that and I respect you for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. When did you talk about that? You talked about that in an episode. I'm not sure if it was, or if Linus talked about it on his WAN show of your reasoning for it, or. <laughs> no, like, he, yeah, I remember your like, reasoning like, for it. He's like, I have to know. I want. I want a phone call. I have to know. 
but uh that's right <laughs> we never we never really got it i mean i never really got a chance to talk about it but yeah there, there's an i i kind of inherited a an extensive toilet lid like toilet tank lid collection because whatever and it's like yeah that seems completely insane <laughs> because whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's just so many there's so many. So um, do you ever like use any of them on your regular toilet? Decide like, you know what? I want to poop in this toilet. today. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, when I explain it, it's going to seem like not, it's going to seem way less magical because it's one of those things where it's like, Oh yeah, I guess this is a thing. It turns out that plumbers like any plumber, like if you know a plumber, that's a career plumber, that's been a plumber for a long time. I guarantee you that you're going to find one that has a collection of toilet lids. And so I made friends with a plumber basically and uh he doesn't he doesn't work anymore and so he left me these these are in my basement and it's kind of <laughs> like a you know it's one of those like monkey paw things where it's like oh the simplicity of like you know a trade job you can you know go go and unplug your thing and blah 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 and also I kind of refer to myself as a computer <laughs> janitor from from time to time so <laughs> You know, working on toilets, you don't accidentally order a 55-gallon drum of barbecue sauce. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, that's a callback to two hours ago. (laughs) But I've got got a huge number of these lids, and I don't want to throw them away because they're actually, some of them are kind of valuable. So, but I do need to get them out of my basement. Well, so, so no, and I know that's not an abnormal thing because I know there's some plumbers that they'll go into these uh, jobs where they're either assisting with demolition or just redoing a house and they end up just acquiring this large collection of toilets. And then just some of them take them to the above and beyond where they just set them up in their backyard with actual running water. <laughs> so, so I don't know about you can poop well, outside. No, 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 because all the water just dumps onto the ground into a drainage ditch. It was like, oh, so this toilet, it, the mechanism flushes it this way and it uses this many gallons of water. <laughs> it's like, it's like, there's entire YouTube channels of this crap. It's, 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 it's <laughs> God, that's going to be me someday. If you're, if you're a tradesman, though, like when you just go to like replace the ballast or like do, like think about what 99% of the time you're not replacing a toilet, but but the seals and stuff on them do fail. And when you right. work on them as a, as a plumber, depending on what you're doing, you know, there's a non-trivial chance that just moving the lid that you just bind it the wrong way and it chips or cracks or scratches or whatever. So mm-hmm. that's a really easy way to undo your mistake is just every time somebody gets a new toilet, just save the lid because eventually someday you're going to need one of those lids. Not only that, you know, sometimes somebody might actually break the lid, you know, just cleaning their bathroom or, Remember when people used to put like the fuzzy slip covers over stuff? It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. you just torque it the wrong way and it shatters in your hand. That's the thing that happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, said, you say that. So that. as an electrician as well by trade, I have a good collection of ivory slash off white slash eggshell white uh, light covers both the older smaller light switch cover or the old plug with the ovals or the newer decor or just big rectangle style and i've just got boxes of those covers because people will break one cover while painting or retighten it or something and then yeah you can't buy them anymore yeah exactly i mean mm-hmm. there's 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 it's always disturbed me because like you know being from the sticks like the trade jobs and like the white collar jobs, I guess you you would call them. There's not like, it's not, there's not like a stigma or anything, or at least there doesn't seem to be. But I've noticed that like in more metropolitan areas, there's definitely like the white collar, blue collar separation. And mm-hmm. in a lot of ways, you know, some of the blue collar workers are, are to be kind of envied. I mean, some of the stuff that you do, like probably all of us working at, you know, professionally and this side or the other. Imagine having a job that makes you happy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. It's nice. <laughs> Chris, we need to just get you into the into the uh the workspace at some point. Yeah, I just need to stop being a neat, but COVID kind of ruined my plans. No, you so, have to be yeah. a neat with me. <laughs> I don't learn RTX. But, 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 but Chris already <laughs> no longer qualifies as a neat because he has a bachelor's degree. So. Oh, darn. No, Simmons, the E for education doesn't mean educated. It means currently in. Yeah. Right? Uh, it is a state of being. Uh, so yeah. it's not a set of qualifications. So yeah, I, I can still qualify for the neat life. I just, I just don't want That's to. That's a neat life. 
Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, up, there are a lot of people in our audience that you know they're like, I feel bad because I live at home and I have a PhD, and it's like, no, don't feel bad. Like, like I don't know why as a society that we try to like look down on those traits. It's like mm-hmm. you know, being an electrician or being a plumber or a general contractor; those things have never been in more demand than than ever, and those are those are perfectly reasonable professions. And See, it's because yeah. it's because we pushed everybody to go to college at some point, and I don't even know. So now we have a generation of people with degrees that they didn't even need or probably want. I will say first and foremost that I'm one of the biggest preachers of the associate's degree and just going to a trade school because I swear to God, my networking uh, career field started at an associate's degree at a community college and it was so affordable and like the education i got there was so much more valuable than the bachelor's and the master's that i got it's like those career fields that are offered at these trade schools you can actually pay for them relatively affordably if you're working up like a part-time job or something and you're going to go into a career field that is either going to be really rewarding or it just gears you to the next career field that you get to try out something else you know it's it's well, really I think the hard thing is that like an actual skilled trade, which is what I took college for my like electrician, you have to go to school for it, have the labs and the teachers and all that. Right. Whereas all these more soft skills like IT and automation and office and admin and all that stuff, that's all stuff you can learn online or on the job. Once you get a job, as long as you can prove that you're actually willing to learn and, and have some decent work ethic. It's not like there's exactly, you know, there's fire code, there's building codes, there's all of these kinds of things. There's not exactly okay. like network code when you're setting up a router to adhere to. I guess there's the FCC to be worried about maybe, but that should be taken care of by the vendor. Well, and then there's if, you, if you're doing any government type, type stuff, then there's always stink compliance and that's a nightmare of its own. <laughs> yeah, but that's, yeah. that's just the unique hell that is working for the government. <laughs> well, it's no, I mean, it, it's more, it's it's more interesting than that because you can, you totally can separate it out and you can isolate it. It's the evolution for computing stuff. It's the evolution of an industry. We do have standards mm-hmm. now for networking and general best practices and blah, blah, blah. And there are some certifications that right now are about 60% grift and 40% <laughs> uh, useful in a best case scenario. Yeah. But look, but look at electrical standards. So I've worked on a lot of like old buildings because I'm kind of like a DIY person and or I just I'm the guy that, you know, is obsessively compulsively harassing the electrician and or plumber that's working on my stuff <laughs> to yeah. ask why yeah. over and over again. Yeah. So, you know, whichever way you want to think about that. And if you look at like the electric light bulb, you know, in the beginning, Edison was like, DC is going to be for the win. So they outfitted an entire town with something that was obsolete in like a year or two. And then, <laughs> uh, you know, Tesla's system won out of the end and one of the first systems that was insanely popular everywhere was knob and tube. It's like, we're going to drill holes. Yeah. In, 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 oh. put ceramic isolators. Cause we learned that if we don't put a ceramic isolator for the wood, the wood might conduct some electricity because wood is not necessarily an insulator. I mean, usually it is, but not always, especially when it's wet and moist. <laughs> yeah. And so all look at that. We've set things on fire. Let's use some ceramic insulators because ceramics are always an insulator under, under every circumstance, pretty much. And, um, you know, and then so knob and tube, and so knob and tube was a thing, and we figured out some stuff, and and then the insulation breaks down, and then it's a problem. But in the beginning, the knob and tube wiring, like you would actually twist copper around other copper and actually solder it, a soldered connection. That seems mm-hmm. like it would last a long time and be good, but we didn't well, really have turns out it's liquid. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it, it it but it also turns out that like you know, in that was at a time when we were using the electric light bulb, and then things kind of evolved and. uh from, from knob and tube and knob and tube stuck around for kind of a while, but then uh, how we rated conductors and what conductors were made out of changed. And so about every 10 years, 15 years from like 1900 to 1910 to 1920 to 1930, we had the world wars. There was a little bit of a distraction, but the standards changed a lot by the 1960s. And so depending on when your house was built, you're going to have a completely different electrical situation in any one of those decades. In 1960s and 1970s, things slowed down a little bit. You know, it's like a 15 or 20 year time scale. Fast forward to 1985. If your house was wired from between 1985 and today, basically the standard hasn't changed. There have been a lot of things added to the standard to increase safety. Like one of the big ones was the melting point of the wire that was moved from 60 degrees C to 90 degrees C. Another one was <laughs> the required diameter of the ground wire. So like the, originally the 
uh, rating for the ground wire was much smaller, but now it has to be the same gauge as the wire that it's contained in. Because if you have a neutral wire that fails completely, it's going to have to carry the same amount of current as the neutral wire. The ground wire will have to carry the same amount of current as the neutral wire does. It seems so obvious, but I'm sure that was skimped out before it was required. <laughs> yes, it totally was skimped out before it was required. But it, even if you're in the unfortunate situation of having the smaller ground wire, now we have more advanced breakers called AFCI, which are already required in some ju jurisdictions. And so the breaker will literally shut off when the ground is actually used because the breaker detects that there's current on the ground wire. So instead of re requiring, you know, the, the physics of the thing to cause the trip and carry the current, it's now done basically electronically. But the bus and the back plane and the connection to the transformer and the fact that most houses have two phases, that hasn't really changed. But the move from 60 amp panels to 100 amp panels to 200 amp panels, pretty much since 1985, any house you get has, has had a 200 amp panel. So from 1985 till now is glacial in comparison to the changes from like 1900 to 1920. And so for computers, we're in about 1925. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. So, like we're at the point now with breakers in those old panels is that you now have 30-year-old 200-amp panels that have more than enough capacity for any house and any person, but you can't buy the breakers anymore because the regular 15-amp breaker is now so old and out of date that they cost about $30 to $40 just to add one breaker alone to your panel. So people are upgrading full panels, even though everything they have is still technically meets code. It's just because it's unavailable or that manufacturer went out of business. Yeah. And that, but that's a much better situation than, than what you would have been in, you know, in the 1920s or 1930s when it's like, yeah, oh, with aluminum or yeah. knob and tube or which I'm, I still do a lot of rentals for that, where you just reuse a lot of the old knob and tube and aluminum, you just fully check it, maybe re-insulate it and rerun it to make sure that there's no cracks or anything. But Half the time, it's still perfectly good. It's just you have to inspect the whole thing. There's also stuff like we just kind of had live wires hanging around, like, you know, uh, commuter switches. So you can turn a light on and off from two switches. You know, it used to just be, OK, here's what you do. You have a light switch and then you wire this to your socket and then you wire this to your other switch. So in <laughs> one out of the four states, the light <laughs> is both off and the socket is hot. <laughs> and yep. that was just a thing that yeah you, you could just, you well, know, just don't just don't touch it it's a switch no 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 it's like, you're like changing, changing the light bulb right uh the socket's just hot so you you stick your finger in there oopsie whoopsie <laughs> i'm not supposed to do that uh, yeah and, and it's just because we don't we don't have standards that are written kind of earnestly now i mean corporations are trying to corrupt the standards like they're trying to get in there and cement oh, themselves God. as like the provider for things. So, I mean, can you imagine yeah. somebody as like like Square D or General Electric in like 1920 being like, "This is how we have to do this," and I need to I need to make a bunch of money. Literally, Edison tried to do that with some of the things, and it backfired horribly because everybody looked around and was like, "Edison, what what are you doing? This this seems you know crooked as heck." And he's like, "Oh, I was just trying to make everything safe." I mean, we have that. That's kind of a good uh, parallel to the current situation for AV codecs. Look at like H.265 just is failing because it's patented and AV1 is just slow to adopt and you got all these different either vendors trying to push their standard as the new way or you've got the open source ones that aren't tied to a specific vendor. Yeah, yeah it's the same thing with server, like the whole open compute thing. Like you know, to, back to reference like three hours ago, I really hope open compute continues to take off because it makes the chassis more generic. And like the HP Enterprise, oh, your hard drives don't have the right firmware. It'd be a shame if something happened to them. All that bullshit <laughs> goes away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, actually what might be even worse than like regulatory capture there, uh, there, God, there was one thing I remember, uh, table saws. So the saw stop is this little... It's a device that can stop a table saw. If it detects current across the blade, then it will trigger this like thing that comes out, jams into the blade. There's like a thousand G's of force in there, and it like mm -hmm. instantly stops the blade. So you can just touch it, and you're not even you're barely going to get a scratch. Um, but the company that made them, while it was still patented, 
tried to get Congress to pass a bill so like every single table saw sold would now have to be equipped with this technology. Why would they do such a thing? I wonder. Uh, but like you know, that's one thing you can get the you can get the government to require it, or you can be like let's say Google and just have such a big market share that you don't even have to adhere to standards. Um, Because, like, if you look at Chrome, for instance, it doesn't necessarily adhere to, uh, like, web standards as far as HTML and JavaScript goes. But because Google has such big, you know, influence on the web, Chrome's got such a big market share, they can just cheat. And now, well, websites are going to be optimizing to Chrome because that's the biggest browser out there. Uh, You've got, you know, all of Google's services. It's totally possible that I'm a boiling frog on this one, but I haven't seen Google do anything as egregious with web standards corruption as what Microsoft did with Internet Explorer 6. (laughs) Not Uh, yet, but yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's... I, I think it's getting to the point where it's probably going to be comparable, and also it doesn't help that Mozilla is being run by idiots. So, <laughs> hey, yeah. hey, hey, man! All I'm going to say is I'm going to keep running my Pale Moon browser to the ground. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I'm going to continue to use Firefox until I can no longer use Firefox because I, I just don't trust Google on principle. Uh, I was gonna say for for context, Pale Moon is just a, an open source browser based on a really old build of Mozilla. <laughs> wow, Mozilla thing that's open source. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> you know what the other the other browser that I think is doing that even more egregiously is Safari. Safari oh, yeah. has yeah. corrupted a lot of stand like they have some really interesting reads of a bunch of standards, and it's really frustrating yeah. to work over. It's- I think iOS 14 is the one that added the ability to use um, other than system default like browsers and whatnot uh, for applications. So yeah, yeah. Well, see, even Microsoft iOS. needs to learn from that. I still no, hate see, that, that every that's... time you open a link in Windows where the search or from settings, it still uses Internet Explorer. Not even Microsoft Edge or your default browser. It still opens Internet Explorer for no, the see. help links. See, it's sure. it's insane. It's more insane than that because, like, iOS lets you have a, de- a non-default browser, but when you download a browser from the App Store, it's the Safari page renderer inside the application. Oh, 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 oh no! What's the point then? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hang on. Where, where's that picture? Uh, hang on. I think Apple did that because they figured that Congress creators are stupid, and they'll be like, no, we've got lots of competition on the browser. We let people pick right, other apps. Yes. <laughs> yeah. the, non, the non-cropped version, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I, 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 I think on this high note, it's a good time to wrap up this recording. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's so, been a huge pleasure having you on, Wendell. We definitely yeah, appreciate no. it. Oh yeah, no problem. It's been fun. Yeah, yeah. I, honestly, I don't think we, if uh, even if we didn't stop this recording, we could probably keep going on for hours and on and about things that we hate about the industry. <laughs> All right, Wendell. Uh, once we go no. off the air, tell us secrets. Violate something. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, thanks again, Wendell, and uh, goodbye. Oh, oh, yeah. Bye again. <laughs>